uh, on Sunday uh, via Facebook Live and YouTube through the month of June. This, quite frankly, allows us two important things. Number one, it allows us additional time to prepare for in-person worship with more normalcy and less constraining mitigations. We all want to get back together to worship the Lord and to see each other, um, but yet we don't want it to be counterproductive and so awkward uh, that uh, it uh, is unfulfilling. There is another reason uh, that I will admit that we're going to go on a month-to-month basis and continue this through June, and that's because Jessica and Jonathan and Pastor Steve need some vacation. We need a bit uh, of a break. It has been a long haul for us, and uh, we need a change of scenery, and so uh, this will allow us to do that. And we thank you very much for caring for us in that way. Now, your longing to be with each other was clearly expressed. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to start informal gatherings in the Walnut Creek parking lot or lawn on Sunday evenings at 6 p.m., weather permitting. If it's storming, we're not coming inside. So if you want to sit out in the rain, that's fine to see each other or at least have a drive-by in the car and wave. You're welcome to do that. So we ask you that you BYOC, bring your own chairs, and we'll catch up with each other safely outside. The building will only be open for restroom usage. Now, we're still going to need extraordinary patience and kindness and graciousness towards each other, even if we're getting together informally. So we uh, will ask you to do that, but you will have the opportunity to uh, be with each other uh, according to your choice and how comfortable you feel. So meet us tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, out in the, in the uh, parking lot or um, the lawn. Well, that concludes our announcements. Let's shift some gears and turn our attention to Acts. The book of Acts chronicles the expanse of Christianity from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world. And the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to redeem people from their sins and to give them a new sense of rightness and righteousness and grant them new and eternal life. This message, this good news could not be contained as it spread like a pandemic. The same gospel that spread then, as we read in the book of Acts, is the same gospel that continues to spread like wildfire in our lives and throughout the world. So, what we have been doing is we've been taking cues from the apostles and Paul how to become missionaries in our changing culture. How can we share the good news of Jesus Christ where God has strategically placed us and with those around us? Now, some of you may be thinking, wait a sec. Why should I share that good news if I'm not sure I've heard it yet or understand it completely? Or how can I share the good news of Jesus if I'm not sure I believe in him yet? Those are really good questions, and I I am glad that you're asking them. I'm also glad that you've tuned in because you're about to hear about a man named Saul in the passage I'll read. He may be referred to as Paul also. How this man heard the good news and believed in Jesus as his Savior and Lord. So turn with me or look on your monitor to Acts chapter 21. I'll start in verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Uh, Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Sicily, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps of the temple and motioned to the crowd. And when they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. 
And when they heard him speak in Aramaic, some of you may be wondering what Aramaic is. Aramaic is very similar to Hebrew. About 250 verses in, uh, in Scripture are written in Aramaic. It was the common uh, language of the day in the Middle East. But when they heard Paul speak in their native tongue, Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicily, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people, these Christians, as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished." About noon, as I came near to Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all the people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized. And wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. This is God's word. People love a good story. Stories are the reasons that we stay awake late at night to finish a book watch a movie or binge on Netflix. Stories engage us like little else. Stories can make information more compelling. Stories can create emotional journeys that make us want to act. And storytelling may seem like an old fashioned tool today, and it is, but that's exactly why it is so powerful. Life happens in the narratives we tell one another. A story can go where quantitative analysis is denied permission, our hearts. Data can persuade people, but it doesn't inspire them to act. To do that, you need to frame your findings in a story that fires the imagination and stirs the soul. One of the best events at our family gatherings and family reunions is storytelling. Recounting the incidents and adventures and misadventures and events of our lives. And each story usually begins with, remember the time when... Remember the time when Allie's head got stuck in the bleachers and we couldn't get it out? 
Remember the time when Nate got lost and we ran all around the hotel searching for him? Remember the time when we went to the Super Bowl together and the Steelers won? Remember the time we went and they lost? Remember the time we celebrated Grandma Mary's 90th birthday? And remember the time when we gathered for her funeral? You've heard lots of my stories throughout the years. Remember the time when as a kid I actually started, I accidentally started a steamroller at a construction site and I had to drive it until I figured out how to turn it off? Remember the time my family almost lost our car uh, to the rising tide because it got stuck in the sand at the beach? Walnut Creek has lots of stories. Remember the time when we were only six families that started the planting of this congregation? Remember the time for 10 years we had to set up and tear down each Sunday as we met in schools? Remember the time when Uncle Oliver, who passed away at 100 years old, left a half a million dollars to us so we could build our building? Remember the time when we sent folks to the Granville Chapel, and to Story Presbyterian Church so that they could be fruitful and multiply. The Apostle Paul has a story that he shares. It's the story of the time when he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and at how it changed his life immediately and how it changed his purpose for living. It's an oft-repeated story. Because the story of Paul's conversion is found several times in the New Testament, three times in the book of Acts. In chapter 9, we hear the story from Luke's perspective as he tells it and gives an, a, his, a historical uh, account, a factual account of Paul's story. We just read from chapter 22. This is Paul's Hebrew version spoken in Aramaic to a Jewish audience. In chapter 29, Paul shares his story before the Roman governors Festus and Felix, and, and there Paul gives it a Roman slant. It's kind of his Gentile version. The same story, but he, he contextualized it to his audience. In Philippians 3, he writes his story, but he gives the theological version, rather than just historical details, but rather with changes in his thinking. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he briefly shares his story to encourage his young protege, Timothy. Why is Paul's story repeated? Why does Paul like to share his own story so often? Well, number one, he loves to tell people about Jesus Christ. And number two, he's doing what Jesus charged him to do, and what Jesus charged all Christians to do. It's the outline of the book of Acts found in chapters 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, get up, you will be my witness, Paul. The key word is witness. You will be my witnesses. If you're called to testify in a court of law or by giving an affidavit, um, what are you asked to do? Tell your story. That's what a witness does. They tell their own factual story from their perspective. They don't tell someone else's story. They don't make up a story. They recite the facts of the story, and that's called a witness's testimony. When Paul tells his story, he's being a witness for Jesus Christ. He's giving his testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ forgave his sins, and they were many, and that Jesus changed his life forever. Let's go back to our passage in Acts 21 and 22. There's a major public protest in Jerusalem. Folks had dragged Paul to the temple and were trying to kill him there. 
Roman soldiers had to come up, come in and break up the protest and they rescued Paul. And as the soldiers are taking Paul to safety, Paul asked the commander for a favor. May I please speak with the people? I mean, Paul politely asks to speak with the people. He's got no high horse here. He's, there's none of this, oh, don't you know who I am? Arrogance or privilege. Just a simple request, which the centurion grants. And Paul, who's obviously being tried in the court of public opinion, gives his defense, gives his testimony He shares his story with his accusers. And his story has a simple framework, a simple outline. In verses 1 through 5, he shares his life and actions before he met Jesus. And then verses 6 through 16, he talks about how he met Jesus. What were the the occasion and the events specifically of how he came face to face with Christ? And then verses 17 through 21, he shares his life after he met Jesus. And Paul is saying to his accusers, he's on the stand in a sense. Before I met Jesus, I was a Jew just like you. So zealous a Jew that I I studied under Gamaliel. I became a Pharisee and, and I actually persecuted folks who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And then one day I was going to Damascus to root out and punish Christians. And a light brighter than the noonday sun blinded me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Isn't that interesting? Paul's going to persecute people. But Jesus says, in persecuting people that believe in me, Paul, you are harming me. And why are you doing that? And what was Paul's response? Who are you, Lord? I asked. Well, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. What what shall I do, Lord? And Jesus told Paul to go to Damascus and wait. And another devout and respected Jew, Ananias, visited Paul and miraculously restored his eyesight. And then Paul tells us what happened afterward. I went back to Jerusalem. But there the Lord told me to leave, that it wasn't safe to be there yet. And the Lord told me that I was to go to the Gentiles, to to whom I would eventually share my story with all over the world. A very simple but intentionally crafted story. Before he met Jesus, how he met Jesus, and his life after he met Jesus. When the Apostle Paul stood before King Agrippa and Festus and those guys in Acts 26, he spoke simply, logically, and clearly about his life before salvation, how he met Christ, and what his life was like after conversion. It was the same exact outline. John Newton was a former slave trader who became a Christian. He eventually became a pastor and he wrote many hymns One of them, Amazing Grace, which is probably his most famous. John Newton wrote his own epitaph. That means like, this is what he would like on his gravestone. And interestingly enough, it follows the same succinct outline of Paul's story. Listen to it. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, That was his life beforehand. Was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, and pardoned, he met Jesus. And appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy, nearly 16 years at Olney and Bucks and 28 years in this church. So John Newton, what would he like to be remembered, shared his story his life before Jesus, how he met Jesus, and what Jesus had done for him, and his life afterward. Now here's where you can apply this sermon. I want you to craft your story, your good news testimony, your life before Christ, 
how you met Jesus Christ and your life after Christ. A sentence or two for each part will do the trick. Nothing complicated, but something that you've intentionally thought through. Think of it as um, marketing people call it your elevator pitch or your elevator presentation. Short enough to present in, your, in an uh, elevator ride with someone. I remember when Tammy, my wife, was um, going to New York City to meet with some of the staff members and board members of her ministry, Pericaleo. One of the board members lives in a, in a very nice section of Manhattan. And before she had, uh, as Tammy was getting ready to go, this board member said, Tammy, I'd like you to perfect your elevator pitch about Pericaleo. Because you might, when you come up to my townhome, in my place, uh, Kate Blanchett might be in the elevator with you, and I want you to share your story of Pericaleo and what it means to women. It won't be long. You're only going to have about 14 floors to do it, but perf- perfect your pitch. Now, if you think that an elevator story, a three-point um, outline is, is too simplistic because you are an English or a literature major and you want something more challenging and creative and substantive, then I'm going to ask you to follow the outline of Hollywood's best storytellers, Pixar. Now, spoiler alert, here's the outline of every Pixar movie. It doesn't matter if it's Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, Up, Brave, Inside Out, or Onward. It's the same outline. Once upon a time, every day, until one day. And because of that, and because of that, and because of that, until finally, and ever since then, that's every movie in Pixar. Once upon a time, little Stevie Resch lived with his family in Alexandria, Virginia in 1971. And every day, he played with his sisters and his neighbors and friends, and he went to school, first grade. Until one day, his parents took him to church where he was given my little Bible. And because of that, He read my little Bible over and over again. Yes, this is the actual one. And because of that, he liked the stories of Jesus. And because of that, he wanted Jesus to be his friend forever. Until finally, he asked his mother how Jesus could be his friend forever. And his mother said, all you have to do is ask him. So seven-year-old Stevie Resch went up to his bedroom and knelt beside his bed and prayed that Jesus would forgive him of his sins and be his friend forever. And ever since then, Stevie Resch and Jesus have been lifelong friends. Such good friends that Steve Resch has served and told people about his friend, Jesus Christ. As Christians, every one of us has a testimony, a story of the way that Jesus has worked in our lives. And regardless of your background or past, God wants to use the stories of both hardship and victory in our lives to transform the lives around us. It is truly beautiful how he can redeem the most difficult parts of of our lives and to use them to impact others for his kingdom. By telling your story, you are truly telling his story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus,